I never expected any of this, you know. I just thought we were doing the album for gigs around town. But you Girl, were you in for a surprise? Who is the greatest? We are the greatest. Are you sure? Yeah. Positive, yeah. positive. Yeah. All, all right, right, all right. right. Who came up with the idea of this collaboration? Um, Clay Ross, our guitarist. Fast forward a few years, Clay moved to Brooklyn. And when he moved to Brooklyn, he put together a band and they played uh, all over the world. They, they still travel quite a bit. And while he was going all over the world, he noticed that he would see all of these other bands and they were playing music from their home or their region or whatever have you. And so he, you know, called us up and he said, you know what? Why aren't we doing any of the music from, you know, the low country? You know, no one out there is really putting Gullah out there in a more contemporary form. So that's sort of the, the short version of the story, um, the four of us. And then um, we said, well, we got to have some serious vocals. And uh, we said, well, there's only one other person that we could probably find. In-step serious vocals. In-step <laughs> serious vocals right there. So that's the short story of, of uh, Ranky Tanky Starts. Charlton, did you immediately understand what he was describing? What he said that he knew, you know, he desired and, you know, thought this collaboration could happen. Did you immediately understand it or did you have to work at it? Uh, the first thing that I thought honestly was, are you crazy? <laughs> because um, it's something that, you know, I grew up with, you know, um, in church. You know, you hear people speak it, or at least where I'm from, Allwindaw, or 10 Mile, you know, in the Allwindaw community. You know, everybody, you know, you, you speak it. It's uh, the way that people um, praise, you know, in church. It's the way that they cook. You know, it's a whole number of things. And then just going up and down Highway 17, you see all of the basket weavers. You know, you come downtown. You know, there's the Gullah community that's downtown. You know, you keep going further down in the Beaufort area and, you know, the other sea islands and everything. Some of the sea islands that are right off of uh, Isle of Palms, you know, like Capers Island, which is where my grandfather was born. So when he first said it, I was like, we were like, why would we do that? You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of common, you know. And then Clay said, well, it's not really common outside of here. And if we put a little spin on it, you know what, that might be a little something. So uh, we uh, rethought it and uh, changed up uh, our approach musically with it. Um, and uh, there you have it. You know, that's how it came about. I love that spin that you put on it. Too. Yes. I yes. love that. And, and you are from L.A. Yeah, L.A. Lower, Lower all. All <laughs> <laughs> And you are from, careful with the pronunciation of this, Harleyville, Harleyville, not Hollywood, though you are star studded. Oh, they tap your shoulder and your immediate reaction, Kiana. I was like, you know, I'm very familiar with the Gullah culture. Um, but when we first, our first gig we played together, I was like, I don't know what this is. I actually didn't find out the band's name until we walked on stage that. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Marion Square. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I had no idea. Oh yeah, the Marion Remember Square. The first one yes, we did? it was yeah. just the three of us. Yes. Yes. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "What, Ranky Tanky?" Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were just showing up to sing. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> That's what you do. Huh? That's what she did. I trusted people who called me. You know, I work with decent people around mm -hmm. town, <laughs> and uh, we we've been rehearsing. You know, Clay would come into town, and we rehearsed like twice, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that was our, like, it was almost like a Cole Reed going out there and performing at Marion Square, New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. That's when we had mm -hmm. our first Ranky Tanky gig. Yeah. And so when you describe Ranky Tanky and your vocals, how would you describe what you're doing? Um, I would say, I, I like to call it like almost like gumbo, a mixture of gospel, you know, the the feel recordings we use to, you know, get these songs, take take these songs and record them. Uh, 
And then we add jazz to it, or jazz flair. So we do just mix it all together and our interpretation, which is pretty much what jazz is. Pretty much. Um, if you listen to Ranky Tanky, you hear definitely, um, there's definitely gospel influences. Mm -hmm. There's definitely jazz influences. There's definitely rhythm and blues. Folk. You know, folk. Oh gosh, yes, folk. You know, so um, all of those, all of those different styles of music, which is, um, ones that we have all played individually and uh, sometimes uh, as a small group. Um, um, you know, Kiana and I play in other ensembles together. Um, Kevin and Quentin have been a uh, rhythm section, you know, duo for so many years. Um, Clay and uh, Kevin you had a band together as a rhythm section. Um, uh, Kevin, Quentin, and myself had a band together. Uh, um, you know, I, I sit in and play in Kiana's band. Kiana plays in my band. So and then we between had Kevin, Kiana, and Quentin. Kevin, Kiana, and Quentin. And then we had you know, Kiana and Clay doing you know, the wedding. Doing, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so this so, is one family. Yeah. It is. Really it is. A family. It is. Kind of a lot of moving parts. But because we all have played so much, so much together and we have played so many different styles together and when we bring that to uh, a, a new song that Ranky Tanky is going to present or we arrange the new song, so all of those influences from all of those different styles come into play and that's what makes it so fresh because these songs are really, you know, dated. They're, um, they're timeless, you know, honestly, um, but uh, when you put a new spin on it, you know, like we do, um, that's that's what the, the draw is. Why did I not know that this was being made? Uh, How long has the band been together? About three years, Almost technically. Three. Yeah. But the the large boom in the band and the popularity and everything, all of the blessings of you know NPR and some of the big name festivals that we've been able to play, um, those are probably in the last year. Um, but um, the thought, you know, the, the official timeline from when it was thought of and when we started trying to gather music, um, I think the, it was Kiana maybe about two years ago, but prior to that, the, four, the other four of us, we had been sort of fishing around with ideas and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of people know us locally and consider us to be a local band, but we've technically only played here three times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was once without Kiana. Um, and actually the name of the band was Clay Ross Fortet, I think, or something like that. But we did a few Ranky Tanky songs just as instrumentals. Um, and then we did uh, the New Year's Eve, which was, uh, uh, was it first night? Yeah. Yeah, we did New Year's Eve. And then uh, we had our CD release party just this past October. How did the name Ranky Tanky come about? Uh, Clay Ross. Pain in my head. Um, there's a song called, or oh, there's a, a, a kid's game called Ranky Tanky. And um, it just seemed to fit, you know. Um, it's a cure-all, we, we, like we like to joke and say, you know. Pain in my arm, Ranky Tanky. It'll cure it. Pain in my legs, Ranky Tanky. Pain in my head, Ranky Tanky. Pain all over me, Ranky Tanky. <laughs> yes. I think you were expressing, Kiana, that you you grew up with this music as well. Do you think the music that you heard in Harleyville was any different than the music that we may have heard um, on the Sea Islands and in the Low Country in Charleston proper? Do you think that that music was any different? Um, a little, but the rhythm was still the same. You know, and sometimes the words, the lyrics that I sing, it's still the same song, it's still the same skeleton, but we switch up the words a little bit, but we can join in and sound check. We play around with a lot of songs, and we all know, you know, it has that same skeleton, that format, so it's pretty much the same, you know. Just like, uh, just like any, um, you know, from village to village, mm -hmm. you know, it might be the same song, but um, you know, this village sings it just a little bit different than this one. You know, this one sings it a little bit different from this one. Um, uh, we can sing Watch That Star one way downtown. 
But if you go out to McClellanville, watch that star, it's going to be just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still going to be the same. Uh, probably about 90% of it is the same. You know, that same song is going to be a little bit different if you go to Beaufort. It's going to be a little bit different if you're on St. Helena Island. It's a little bit different if you are on Amelia Island, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, the, the lyrics, you know, might be a, the, the, probably the biggest difference in terms of um, the rhythm, though. That's just constant. That driving Gullah rhythm, that's always going to be there. At the heart of Gullah music and spirituals, generally there is a struggle. And yet when I'm listening to this music, I hear somewhat of a, a party. There's a celebration sometimes with some of the music, um, kind of like you're in a juke joint. So it's kind of like um, a juke joint, maybe at the back of the church, you know, <laughs> or somewhere. Been there. <laughs> We all so, have. But, yeah, is that, you know, is that, um, is that my imagination? Is that a, a part of the goal? I mean. But if you think about spirituals, um, most spirituals are based in uh, the faith of everything's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. And making sure that you, you have that, that, uh, that feeling and that spirit of, uh, of, of rejoicing. Not all of them, you know, technically, not all of them are gonna be up like that. Um, but um, at the root of it all, at the heart of it all, at the center of it all, it's that faith that, you know, I'm gonna make it through, you know, whatever, you know, the problem is, whether it's an illness, whether it's a, a death, you know, whether it's um, just, you know, getting through that hard time, you know, but you have that faith, which is what you know, you know, all of those, you know, residents and slaves they had, they, they, they kept on, you know, believing that, you know, even though we have all of this bad stuff happening, you know, it's gonna, you know, we have faith that it's gonna carry us through. And so when we interpret some of these songs, you know, some of them are, you know, are a little bit on the calmer side, mellower, but then um, even some of the ones that may have had you know, that mellow tone, you know, we've arranged it. And so it sounds a lot um, more uplifting. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the best word, mm -hmm. is that uh, a lot of our songs, we, we hope that they are as uplifting um, when, um, when people hear them. Sometimes we experience things differently. And some people like the process. And then, you know, once the event happens, it's different, but they just love the process. I'm, I'm curious what it is for the two of you. For me, it's on stage. Definitely on stage. I mean, we were at Czech Republic. Oh there gosh. Thousands of people going crazy. And we came back out. That was, that was like the first surreal moment for me. Like this is really happening. We're in Czech Republic. In the and, middle of the woods. Yes, and they're screaming <laughs> ranky tanky, you yes. know? Yeah. yeah, like and they didn't. I'm sure couldn't understand many of the words. Probably not a whole lot. Yeah. But, but that rhythm. But the rhythm and just um, the, um, just the the joy and the excitement and the energy that was there. Um, we finished the last song. They were still, they were still clapping and dancing, and we walked off the stage and and. Uh, and um, we, we have this thing where we kind of we kind of sing this song a cappella as we walk off stage and we get the crowd clapping and everything and they just would not stop after we were gone and we walked back out and and Calvin jumped on the drums and started just just started playing you know and it, it was just a really really fantastic moment and you know they were all just hands waving, clapping, people were standing up, you know, just, it was fantastic. And that was probably the, the, the truest just spirit and energy of that music at its, at its height for us, you know, um, on that tour. You know, we were blessed to go to five different countries um, on, the, you know, this past summer and, and, and play in some really great arenas. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I honestly thought, where are we when we were in the Czech Republic? Because it literally was in the middle of the woods. I mean, it, it might as well have been in the middle of Francis Marion, you know, the, the, the place that we put it. But there were just a thousand people. You got to move. You got to move. Yeah. 
the performances that we have done to date have all either been a festival where it's a lot of different performers and you are on a stage you know they could have a main stage they could have a side stage or something like that so we've done a number of festivals or we've done um, performing arts centers um, and then a lot of times um, with the performing arts centers we will uh, do like an educational you know component so we'll go to a school and we'll you know perform for students and speak with students and take questions from them and you know sort of uh, talk to them a little bit about uh, the Gullah culture and uh, sometimes about just being musicians and things like that but um, at the beginning of the year we we sort of did a showcase and um, in the showcase we just played for like 15 minutes and all of these presenters you know from um, from different cities, whether they were representing um, uh, cultural arts, um, you know, uh, they were the head of the cultural arts in their city, or whether they were the, you know, the, the director of a festival or, or something like that, and they come and they watch. And then after maybe about three days, between three days after that performance and maybe about a week, you know, you start getting calls, you know, to see if you're available. And we were just very fortunate and blessed that you know, I think we <laughs> we left last year and we were talking about, well, you know, everybody's kind of got their schedule, so maybe we'll do about 15 shows. Mm. Yeah, we ended up doing close to 60. <laughs> Just, it was a blessing, you know, I mean. 60 shows? About, it was about, it was it was close mm -hmm. to that. Just over 50 or something. I, I, I can't count, wow, I don't remember. that's a lot. That is a lot, but. I don't think people realize Performing is the easy part, really. Very much the, the easy part. The business during yeah. the day, yeah. we're constantly respond. Like I'm constantly checking out. Like, wait a minute, I'm, I gotta respond to this. Right. I gotta read this. The mm -hmm. business part during the day, that's my full time job. Mm -hmm. Reading emails and yeah. responding back. <laughs> yeah. But it's if you think about this, you know, you you ask any uh, like professional athlete, they'll tell you the hard part is putting in the work to get to the actual event. reach number one on Billboard on the jazz charts and contemporary jazz charts. Really? So that is that was I was like, just, okay, so we made it. Like we yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay, this what, is success. What, what's that like going to local schools and having been a student, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. right here locally? Uh -huh. How does uh -huh. that feel? Oh it's great. Um, uh, it's really good, you know, just as an educator when you see you know, the light bulb come on with that little kid that you're talking to and they understand what it is that you're talking about or they, they become more interested. Um, and uh, as uh, someone that spent time in the classroom, you know, in this county, as a, as a product of this county, you know, Charleston County, um, and uh, as a product of South Carolina State University, um, going in and telling my story about you know, practicing hard and uh, all of the places that I've been able to to go and perform in front of and then sharing that with students. Um, sometimes I I, uh, I get points, I think, with them when I bring in like a picture of me in the sixth grade or in the fourth grade with my little <laughs> violin or something like that. And they're like, really, that's you? And I was like, that's me, you know? And then, you know, they'll, you know, find out later about the success, you know, or something about, about that. Um, but I, I just think that it's important, especially for, especially for students here to see somebody from here, you know, to see, you know, me, you know, from here that has gone on and been successful. One of the things that I talk about a lot is um, jazz in the low country and how important jazz as a whole, how important the low country is to jazz. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the Jenkins Orphanage wa a lot, and then I gradually push it out to the state of South Carolina, and I talk about people like, you know, Dizzy Gillespie being from the state of South Carolina, yeah. Lonnie yeah. Hamilton, yeah. our local, you know, Eartha Kitt being from, yeah. from here, you know, we were just talking to Nick Ashford, you know. You know and just, then the kids <clears throat> love the plunger. Oh, the plunger yeah. Story. Yeah, the plunger <laughs> story. <laughs> so um, if you're a jazz trumpet player or, oh. or, uh, or you are a, um, a jazz trombonist, 
you have mutes that you put in your horn and it changes the sound. And um, you use a plunger, like a, mm -hmm. you know, trombonists use a toilet plunger because of the, the size of it. Uh, trumpet players use a plunger for a sink. Um, and so you, you make that, that sound with it, you know. And um, uh, when I play for the students and I say, where have you heard that from, aside from me? And they're all like, I don't know, I don't know. You know, and I said, well, next time you listen to or you watch Charlie Brown and you hear an adult talk on Charlie Brown, you know that, you know, that's actually someone, you know, with a trombone and a plunger. Then I take it a step further and say, that that technique of using a plunger was actually started by residents at Jenkins Orphanage here in the Low Country. And then yeah. they're like, wow. And then they're like, what? <laughs> you know, usually I tie that into the creativity of, um, of youngsters, you know, and I encourage them to, you know, if you think that there's something new that you are inventing, you know, follow up on it because you just never know, you know, and who would have thought to use a plunger? Mm -hmm. You know, but now if you're a trumpet player and you play jazz or you're a trombone player and you play jazz, you don't you don't go anywhere without your plunger. It's just the norm. You just have to have it. Mm -hmm.